people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. The undisputed super featherweight champion of the world, Alicia, the bomb gardener. Okay, we'll start with this. What is the ongoing rivalry, domestic rivalry, between Clarissa Shield, Shield and Shield, Alicia Shield. Baumgartner? Clarissa's promoter, Dimitri Salidio, said, Alicia Baumgartner never really wanted to fight Clarissa Shields. Oh? Alicia Baumgartner and Clarissa Shields are back at it again. The latest entry in their back and forth outside the ring rivalry last Saturday during the Richardson Hitchens versus Gustavo Limos fight card in, I can't pronounce that. It's Fontainebleau. Las Vegas, several media outlets, and who knows how many amateur iPhone videographers captured Shield, Shield who served Shield, as on-air talent for the broadcast in Baumgartner in a heated, protracted argument. If nothing else, the confrontation brought up a question. Given the length and intensity of the fighters' rivalry, why haven't Shields and Baumgartner yet stepped inside the ropes to hash things out? Good number of reasons. When the rivalry between them came to a head and it first kicked off, Happening in the background was Alicia Baumgartner's anti-doping fiasco that needed to be sorted out before she could move forward to have a fight with anyone, Clarissa Shields or somebody else. Dimitri Salida, Shields' promoter, recently spoke to Boxing Scene about the odds of a Shields versus Baumgartner fight happening. Alicia is out here speaking complete nonsense, going on on Shaquille O'Neal's podcast, talking about fighting Clarissa, Salida said. It is like Manny Pacquiao challenging Mike Tyson. Not exactly. Mike Tyson knocked people out. Clarissa Shields doesn't. It is so ridiculous, it's not real. And people that don't really know boxing or follow women's boxing, they just see the names. They don't understand weight classes, but they think about it and talk about it. He's not wrong. There's too many weight classes between them. Salida, who has sought to revive boxing in Detroit region with a developmental show box-like series on zone, has known Baumgartner for some time. A Fremont, Ohio native now training under Bill Haney in Vegas, Baumgartner rose to fame as a professional in Detroit. Known Alicia for a long time, like way, way before, Salida said. We have always invited her to fights. I am not one to say anything negative, yet there is a certain amount of negativity, completely independent of any beef with Shields, that lingers over Baumgartner's career. Last July, a pre-fight drug test sample for Baumgartner yielded an adverse analytical finding for a banned substance that put her under a microscope and led to a suspension from the Association of Boxing Commissions. And Clarissa didn't pull any punches. She brought it up. She called her a drug cheat outright. Though Baumgartner has since been exonerated by the World Boxing Council, the sanctioning body that collected the sample in question, and according to the fighter, is no longer under any suspension by the ABC Commission. Don't confuse the ABC Commission with the Michigan Unarmed Combat Commission. The Michigan Unarmed Combat Commission never suspended Alicia, but the ABC Commission did. The thing is, the ABC Commission ain't really got teeth. They only oversee the alphabets. They don't actually issue out boxing licenses. Oh. Will be difficult for Baumgartner to fully put the issue behind her until she makes the next fight. What's supposed to be the Delphine Pursuant fight. Is there even a possibility that it could come against Shields? I called her manager, said Salida. We will make the fight at 154. And like Don King used to say, there is only one way to say yes and 99 ways to say no. So they say no in 99 ways. Same could be said about Clarissa. In my previous video, I talked about how in previous years, not that long ago, Clarissa said that she'd be willing to come down to 147 pounds and fight the girls that are there. On that premise, Alicia challenged her, saying that she would be willing to meet her at 147, only for Clarissa to move the goalpost. 
Now it's got to be at 154. All of a sudden. In any case, the promoter suspects Bount Gartner was never really serious about taking on the fighter many describe as boxing's greatest woman of all time. It is all talk. Salita said of Bount Gartner's desire for a Shields fight, it is a way to make herself relevant. Don't flatter yourself. And the way that she has gone about it has not been classy. Alicia Bount Gartner does not need to call out Clarissa Shields in order to stay relevant. She's rubbing elbows with the likes of Michael B. Jordan at movie premieres and having celebrities like Cardi B tweet about her ring walk. Taking selfies with Glorilla, very well-known hip-hop artist. Look at how far apart her eyes are. She's gorgeous. That they would think Alicia Baumgartner, who's been doing the rounds on some very popular podcasts with familiar faces like Shaquille O'Neal, would need to call out Clarissa for clout, if not for Alicia. Did you forget what happened a few weeks ago? A few weeks ago? The only conversation involving Clarissa Shields was the leaked sparring footage of her getting sat on her ass by some nondescript Eastern European fighter in a sparring session. Footage that clearly embarrassed her as she's the one who carries on about how she could beat Triple G and she could beat Keith Thurman. Not if you're getting sat on your ass by that guy. This whole thing between her and Alicia has allowed people to forget and put that in the background of their minds. It's been a distraction. That's the blessing in disguise here. And Clarissa should be thanking Alicia. The fight's not going to happen. For a good number of reasons, the fight's not going to happen. I mean, the weight, the discrepancy in weight is far too great and Clarissa doesn't want to come down to 147. She changed her mind. Now it's got to be at 154 and just imagine what she's going to want for the fight, the money. She's likely going to want more money for the fight than Alicia stands to make, which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if it were Clarissa's promoter paying for it, but in all likelihood it wouldn't be because Dimitri ain't got that kind of dough. Thus, all the talk revolving around the fight and the shouting matches between the two fighters as well as Clarissa Shields going as far as releasing a diss record. It's all much ado about nothing because the fight was never viable. The weight, the money, and Clarissa going back on her words. It's not realistic. It was never realistic. I don't even know why Alicia bothered. The only thing that's come out of this is an opportunity for Clarissa to plug her crummy rap lyrics. Not gonna result in a fight. Men's super lightweight news. On the heels of his big win over Roly Romero and being crowned WBA 140-pound champion, Isaac Pitbull Cruz could renounce WBA title and move back down to 135 pounds. Next week, we will meet with Sean Gibbons, PBC, and my team to decide if I will stay at 140 or go back down to 135. Whatever reason we come to will be the best for me. I'll adjust to 140 pounds, but at a lighter weight, I feel stronger. We will wait for a big name or a big opportunity if it's good for us and work towards that. I think the three are the big names, but I think the most interesting could be Teofimo Lopez and Subriel Matias. I would pick both to beat Isaac Cruz. I think he also mentioned Devin Haney. So if you're hearing something like this, that Isaac Cruz might so decide to drop the WBA 140 pound title so soon after having won it, it's likely because Team Cruz don't feel that Javante Davis will move up to fight him. And that's the priority. A Javante Davis rematch. He's non-committal to those other fights. He's non-committal to any of those other fights with any of those 140 pound champions if he's entertaining the possibility of dropping the belt so soon after having won it. And those could all be lucrative fights for Isaac Cruz, a Teofimo Lopez, unification match or one with Subriel Matias what would be another chapter in the long-standing Puerto Rico versus Mexico rivalry in the sport of boxing any one of those fights could do well commercially but if you're talking about dropping your belt you're non-committal you're not serious how could you be and don't forget that a certain someone that goes by the name Ishmael Barroso just became Isaac Cruz's mandatory challenger. He became Isaac Cruz's problem as soon as Isaac won that belt. The way it looks. If the difference between getting a Gervonta Davis rematch and not getting a Gervonta Davis rematch is dropping the WBA title, I feel that Team Cruz might actually drop it because they could always move down and fight Gervonta for his. Don't forget that Gervonta was elevated to full WBA. WBA champion at 135 pounds when Devin moved up and dropped all his belts. If Javante doesn't want to move up and fight Isaac for his belt, Isaac will move down and fight Javante for his. At which point, if Isaac drops the WBA title, it would be Ishmael Barroso that gets elevated to full WBA champion at 140 pounds, which in some ways would be a fairy tale ending to that entire ordeal, as we all know that he came very close 
to stopping Roly Romero. We know that he heard him. We know that he was up on the cards at the time of that dubious stoppage from Tony Weeks. What would have happened if that contest would have been allowed to go on? Ishmael Barroso has amassed a bit of a cult following because he is a fan-friendly fighter with a very strong punch in spite of his age. Think about it. If Javante Davis takes care of business in his upcoming fight with Frank Martin, Isaac Cruz decides he's going to drop the WBA title and move down to fight Javante for his. The title then goes to Ishmael Barroso, at which point any of the other champions at the wake can pursue Ishmael. Who I don't think would be hard to negotiate with. Seems like a no-nonsense kind of guy. Not a prima donna. Not a guy who's going to ask for an arm and a leg. If he were afforded the chance to fight a Teofimo Lopez and unify titles with him, or a Subriel Matias, or a Devin Haney, I feel like it's an opportunity that Ishmael Barroso would grab with both hands. So it looks. His last fight was on a Golden Boy promotion show opposite the ring O'Hara Davies, who they had recently signed, and we saw what he did to him. He knocked him out. So if he has to go to top rank for an opportunity to fight Teofimo, or go back to the zone for an opportunity to fight Devin Haney, or for an opportunity to fight Subriel Matias, pick your poison, I don't think Ishmael would have a problem. He's already boxed on the zone once. This fairy tale scenario for Ishmael is contingent upon Isaac Cruz dropping the WBA title unless he plans on defending that title against him, against Ishmael. And I don't get the sense that he does because he's talking about dropping it to move back down. Why would he want to do that? Why do you think? To pursue a Javante Davis rematch. The truth is that Isaac, entertaining little fighter that he might be, he could lose to any one of those champions at 140 just as easily as he could lose to Javante again. So what him and his team figure is that if you're gonna lose your next fight, or you could, make the most money that you can. And they might figure that they make the most money fighting Javante instead of those guys. See the strategy. Pero... Yo, Progray, when you see this video, this interview, please give me the opportunity to show the world, you're gonna say, I'm gonna send you to the hospital after the fight, me. Please give me the opportunity. Me, me, I'm gonna send you to the hospital and you know it. And I, I, I got a mention for, for Haney. Haney, don't, don't mention my, my name. And the chicken father, uh, Bill Haney, don't talk in shit, please. Dile que se enfoque en venderle en esta pelea. Que las últimas peleas que él ha hecho en Pay Per View, que tenemos los, el resumen, y él no vende. He says, focus on selling your upcoming fight because we have the receipts for your previous pay per views. And you don't sell. Si con Ryan García, que vendió con el bon un millón, él no vende ni 500, dile que se puede retirar. He says that with Gervonta Davis, Ryan Garcia sold over a million pay-per-view buys. And if you can at least do 500,000 pay-per-view buys, half a mil, you might as well retire. My thoughts. Before Regis Progray lost his WBC title to Devin Haney, the conversation was a Progray versus Matias unification match. And it seems like Subriel still has Regis on the brain. With a few choice words for Devin Haney, saying he doesn't want Devin mentioning his name. Most of you may have forgotten that a few weeks and a few months ago, Bill Haney spoke to the media. Right. And he told them that Subriel Matias had priced himself out of the fight, saying that he wanted $6 million according to Peter Kahn, which is funny because Peter Kahn is not a member of Subriel's team. And he never was. Unless I'm mistaken, this was on a Saturday night immediately after Devin's fight with Regis Progray that Bill Haney imparted this to the media the following Monday on The Boxing Voice. Bill Haney spoke to the actual members of Subriel Matias's team. I got nothing against Bill or Devin, but it seems to me that they were trying to make it seem as if Subriel was avoiding them by telling the media that he priced himself out of the fight. When in reality, you were never in serious talks to make a fight with Subriel Matias. Even after you got up with the right people, the actual members of his team, on the boxing voice, in front of everyone, you still didn't pursue the fight. Because look at who you are fighting. You're fighting Ryan Garcia. And I don't even hold that against him. I understand that. It's a money play. But if you see that Subriel is now telling Devin not to mention his name, I would assume that's the why. That's the reason. Because if you're Subriel Matias, the way it's going to look to you is like Team Haney is deliberately playing games with your name. If you're him. If you're them. 
and you take care of business against Ryan Garcia later on this month, there's really nothing stopping you after that from making a fight with Subriel Matias, who made it a point to bring up Devin's pay-per-view buys. Why? So many fighters in this day and age, especially in the American boxing scene, think themselves stars already for marquee value that they themselves don't necessarily bring to the table, marquee value they don't necessarily have, even if you're in the process of building that. If that's not where you are, then that's not where you are. So adjust your attitude and calibrate it the reality. It's what I took away from that because I don't think for a second Subriel is shaking in his boots over a Devin Haney fight. Devin Haney is not the puncher that Subriel Matias is. Subriel Matias killed a man with his bare hands. I'm not glorifying what he did. I'm just saying I don't get the sense that this is a guy who's fucking around. He's only got one loss on his record and it's a loss that he already avenged. Last five or so guys that he's fought, he's forced all five of them to retire on their stools. This is a no-nonsense character. So let's get it straight. As much as I like Devin Haney and Bill as a team and everything they're doing and what they're trying to do, I still identify this as a very dangerous fight stylistically for Devin Haney. This is not like fighting little old Vasil Lomachenko who was in his mid-30s, who you're bigger than and you're younger than, than getting a generous decision that some people don't think you deserved. And this is not like fighting an economic counterpuncher in Regis Progre, because this is the kind of guy that takes one to give one because he believes he can hurt you. All he's got to do is get in. Stylistically, this is a way more dangerous fight than the Progre fight. It's very funny how it all breaks down in terms of style. That... Even though Devin Haney beat Regis Progre, Regis actually has the right style for a volume puncher. Regis has the style for Subriel, Subriel's got the style for Devin, and Devin had the style for Regis. It's a very dangerous fight for Devin, and Subriel Matias is not a fighter that you want to underestimate. I see it too often in the American boxing scene that sluggers and brawlers and mid-range to inside pressure fighters and volume punchers are often written off as being simple, straight up and down with no bells and whistles. That cookie cutter comment from Floyd Mayweather in reference to Gennady Golovkin years ago has led to a rise in ignorance. The way some guys seem to think that unless you're going out there on ice skates and fighting out of a Philly shell, you don't know how to fight or you're no threat. You better wake up and smell a subdural hematoma, my friend. Super Real Matias is not one to trifle with. And in a very general sense, pressure fighters. For a pure boxer like Devin Haney, they can be particularly dangerous as they're not going to play your game. They're not going to wait for you to give them permission to come inside and let punches go the way a counter puncher would, like Regis. Now this guy's going to come in, crash the pocket, throw punches and bunches, and you've got to hope that you can weather the storm, or you've got to hope that you can create space against him for 36 minutes and keep him off, which is easier said than done. Just telling you, I don't think that's an easy fight for Devin. And I like Devin. I respect him and everything he's doing and what he's trying to do, but make no mistake, anywhere inside of two to three fights, this guy is a clear and apparent threat. Take certain ingredients to beat a pressure guy like this. One or two jabs at a time may not be enough.